Hello and welcome to the recorded message from Lansdowne Evangelical Free Church for Sunday the 14th of August 2022. There's a couple of uh, health warnings uh, or about potential interference with this message. Uh, we are having some work done on the front of the church building so you may hear some background noise and is also bins day so you may hear that also but uh, god willing not uh, and it is very hot today on the day i'm recording i'm hoping i won't have to split this message in two because the camera overheats halfway through um, but please bear with um, and uh, let's pray that god would speak to us through his word through this recording let's bow before him now our Father, we thank you for your greatness and your majesty and your power and your glory. We thank you that nothing will hinder your word, even if there is background noise and, or a, a jump in the middle because the a message recording was paused. Father, you know all these things. You know all about the te technology and about um, our own circumstances, our, our own means of listening, be it on our phones our, or our computers or our, our TVs or uh, just simply listening to the audio, you know all things. And Father, we thank and praise you that we can commit this time into your hands with a confidence that you will speak to us because this is your word. So give us ears to hear, uh, challenge, convict, renew faith today through your word. Help me to be faithful in teaching your word accurately and help us to listen intently and apply your word to us by your spirit. And we ask it in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Today we are back in the Psalms, Psalm 29. Let's hear God's word. Psalm 29, reading from the English Standard Version. Ascribe to the Lord, O heavenly beings, ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Worship the Lord in the splendour of holiness. The voice of the Lord is over the waters. The God of glory thunders, the Lord over many waters. The voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is full of majesty. The voice of the Lord breaks the cedars. The Lord breaks the cedars of Lebanon. He makes Lebanon to skip like a calf and Syrian like a wild ox. The voice of the Lord flashes forth flames of fire. The voice of the Lord shakes the wilderness. The Lord shakes the wilderness of Kadesh. The voice of the Lord makes the deer give birth and strips the forest bare and in his temple all cry glory. The Lord sits enthroned over the flood. The Lord sits enthroned as king forever. May the Lord give strength to his people. May the Lord bless his people with peace. Praise God for his word. Now to whom do, to whom rather, do we pray? What is he like? Often our troubles seem so big that we can't really see anything else. So it helps us if we know who he is, who the Lord is, and how great he is. Now, if you've been following this series in the book of Psalms, the previous three, that is Psalms 26, 27 and 28, have all mentioned the sanctuary, the temple of God, where David longs to be. Although the Psalm 26 to 28 are full of trouble, David's desire to be in God's presence is his greatest priority. And this reminds us, as we've seen over the last three studies in Psalms, that yes, we need answers to prayer, Yes, we come boldly before God. Yes, we're honest and real with him about our needs. But what we need more than anything else, 
more than the needs being met, the physical, emotional, and so on needs being met, what we need more than anything else is him and a sense of his presence. Now, Psalm 29, David gives us a glimpse into the sanctuary of, of God in heaven. And although he didn't have the theology of this, we do through the book of Hebrews, that the earthly sanctuary is just a shadow of the heavenly realities. But he is calling to the hosts of heaven to worship God. And then he gives a glimpse into the power and majesty of God over all things as his word goes out into all creation. And he concludes with a declaration of confident trust that his all-powerful sovereign Lord will strengthen and give peace to his people. We need to know this God and we need to be assured of his strength and his peace that he gives to us. Because that maybe even if things are going okay right now, there are times when we feel weak and we always need that divine peace. And everyone needs to be saved by this mighty, awesome God. We can't, as it were, just say, well, doesn't matter. I can live my life as I please. This God is awesome. He is a creator of the universe and we are accountable to him. And we need to be right with him because he's the mighty God is also the God who saves us. And we turn to him in repentance and faith. But let's unpack this psalm now and apply it to our lives. We see firstly a call to worship. David, who longs to be in God's presence, issues this call to worship in verses 1 and 2 to those who are in his presence. Verse 1, ascribe to the Lord, O heavenly beings, ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. This might seem quite a strange thing for a man, a mere man, although he's a king. It may seem quite strange to call the angels to worship. But when you have a sense of the greatness of the Lord, you want all to worship him. And we see something of this in Psalm 103. It starts, of course, with bless the Lord, O my soul, all that is within me, bless his holy name. But verse 20 to 22 say this, bless the Lord, O you, his angels, you mighty ones who do his word, obeying the voice of his word. Bless the Lord, all his hosts, his ministers who do his will. Bless the Lord, all his works in all places of his dominion. Bless the Lord, O my soul. So David is saying he is worthy of my praise and he deserves the praise from everyone and everything. So there is uh, that same sense here in Psalm 29. And also, if the angel should worship the Lord, how much more should we, who are made by him from the dust of the earth, and who are the bearers of his image. So Psalm 96 and verses 6, sorry, verses 7 to 9, use very similar language, but about the people of the world. Ascribe to the Lord, O families of the peoples, ascribe to the Lord glory and strength, ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name, bring an offering and come into his courts, Worship the Lord in the splendor of holiness. Tremble before him all the earth. So yes, a call to worship to the angels, but therefore an invitation to us also. How do we worship? Well, the content is given here as a scribe. It's mentioned three times. Ascribe to the Lord, O heavenly beings, ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Ascribe means to give, to describe, to declare to be true. Glory and strength and the glory due his name. This is not making God glorious, 
but declaring his glory. Ascribe for the Lord glory. That is, declare his weightiness, his supreme worth. That is what worship is, declaring his supreme worth. That is why our worship needs to be more focused on him than on us. Of course, worship includes a response and thankfulness for what he's done for us, but it's not primarily about what I feel, or that's part of it, it's primarily about who he is, declaring his supreme worth, ascribed to the Lord glory and strength. Verse one, his great power, his might. Our God is not weak like we are. The end of the psalm asks the Lord for strength because he is the source of all strength. And then in verse 2, ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. His name is that description of all that he is. Names in Old Testament scripture were given for that purpose. He is the great I am, the Lord of glory, the eternal one, the covenant keeping God and all of his attributes of majesty and holiness and justice and love and kindness and goodness, his faithfulness, his truth, his unchangeableness, all of these things are to be spoken out, sung out in worship, all he is and what he does. And so as the angels here are called to ascribe these things to the Lord, so too are we, to give him what he deserves with our lips, our thoughts and our lives. So the second part of verse 2 doesn't use the word ascribe, so it's not so much just about speech, it uses the word worship. So while we speak, sing, shout, we ascribe, we also worship. And this includes bowing down and submitting to him. So we worship with our words and with our obedience, our yielding to him as the sovereign Lord. Notice to the character of this worship. Worship the Lord in the splendour of holiness. Now this phrase does seem a little ambiguous. Does it mean in terms of his holiness, i.e. worshipping him for his holiness? Or does it mean, as some translations suggest, approaching him with holiness in ourselves? So as some say, translations have worship him in holy garments or holy array. Now the context here suggests both. God is holy. God is set apart. God is holy other. God is not like us. God is totally pure and righteous. He is a definition of righteousness itself because he is God. But also we therefore need to approach him with holiness. If even the angels veil off their faces before him in Isaiah chapter 6, who are we to enter into his presence in all our uncleanness? The only way therefore we can enter and worship him in holy array is because someone has given us garments of righteousness if Christ himself, of course, again, we see that in Hebrews, we enter through him, through the curtain, through that living way made by him, because he died in our place. He cleansed us from our sins. He's clothed us in his righteousness so we can draw near to him. Notice this also, how full this psalm is of God's name, the Lord. There are... 11 verses. In those 11 verses, the name of the Lord, Yahweh, is repeated 18 times. Why? Because there is none like him. Because he is God. 
He is completely amazing and beyond description and worthy of worship. And our thinking and our speech needs to be full of him. That's what his sum is. It's full of him. Its focus is the Lord of glory. And it's only as we do this and our thinking and our speech are full of him that we truly see the smallness of everything else, even the great and mighty troubles that we face. And while it is good and right to talk about our troubles, to share our burdens with him and with one another, we need to make sure we talk much about him and we think much about him. We meditate on his glory and his majesty, reflecting upon his greatness, not to increase his glory, because his glory is the same in infinite majesty, but to increase our appreciation and our wonder at his glory and therefore our confidence in him. So let's make a conscious choice to meditate upon him and to fill our thoughts with him, to speak about him. So a call to worship because, secondly, of his command of all creation, which is what we see in verses three to nine. He rules over creation and everything exists and is sustained through him. Now the whole section for verses three to nine and again affirmed in verse 10 is an illustration of the Lord's power and majesty through the storm. He is the Lord Almighty, the author of a mighty storm that sweeps from the Mediterranean Sea down from the north of Israel down to the south, as we'll see in a moment. Verse three, the voice of the Lord is over the waters. This is points us back to Genesis, Genesis chapter one and verse two. The earth was without form and void and darkness was over the face of the deep and the spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. The voice of the Lord is over the waters. He rules over the waters in the seas, the waters in the skies, the streams and the rivers. And his mighty storm is arising over the Mediterranean. And it's a sign of his glory. Verse four, 3 again, the God of glory thunders, the Lord over many waters. And notice too, this is due to his voice. And this whole section from verses 3 to 9 again repeats the phrase, the voice of the Lord. We see verse four again. The voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is full of majesty. The voice of the Lord, verse five, breaks the cedars. The Lord breaks the cedars of Lebanon. Verse seven, the voice of the Lord flashes forth flames of fire and so on. So it's through his word. It's his, his word is, uh, he, he speaks, he creates, we see in Genesis 1, and here he sustains and he creates a storm and he sustained a storm. He speaks and it happens. He is truly the ruler of all things, unlike the false gods of the nations, unlike the people of the earth. And this storm, as I've said, makes a journey from the far north of Israel. Verse 5. The voice of the Lord breaks the cedars, the, seed, the Lord breaks the cedars of Lebanon. That is in the far north, then a little bit lower. The voice of the Lord breaks the cedars, verse, um, sorry, the, vo the voice of the, sorry, verse six. He makes Lebanon to skip like a calf and Syrian, that's another word for Mount Hermon in the north again, Syrian like a wild ox. Verse 7, the mention of lightning again. The voice of the Lord flashes forth flames of fire. So verse 3, the God of glory thunders. Verse 7, the voice of the Lord flashes flames of fire. And then we move to the south. The voice of the Lord shakes the wilderness. The Lord shakes the wilderness of Kadesh. That's in the far south. In fact, that's where Israel camped uh, and then failed to enter the promised land which we read about in Numbers. So the whole 
from Mediterranean up to the north and right down Israel to the south. Now the things in these verses are, just, are very mighty. The cedars of Lebanon, I'm told, could grow, grow as high as 30 metres and be even up to 10 metres wide. How great, the greatest as it were of all creation. And Syrian or Hermon is the tallest mountain in Israel, nearly 3,000 meters tall. Yet in verse six, they skip like a calf or like a wild ox. In verse nine, another great thing is that the, 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 the forests are stripped bare. But yet in that verse, in the first part of that verse, it says the voice of the Lord makes a deer give birth. So this is something small and, and tender and personal. The voice of the Lord makes the deer give birth. So from the greatest to something small and tender and personal, all of this is through the power of God's word. The Lord speaks. His word created. His word sustains creation. His word rules creation. And it's the same mighty word that God has given us in scripture. May we never doubt the power of his word. And may we respond as the end of verse 9. In his temple all cry glory. Yes, in the heavenly temple where those heavenly beings are as, as they're called to worship in verse 1. And to those who worship on earth. We don't worship in a physical temple anymore. But when we come in prayer and praise, we come through Christ into the most holy place. And surely we must declare glory we see no longer do we focus primarily upon our troubles even though they're very great and they're very real and they're very painful but we get this glimpse of the majesty and awe and wonder of God and how to, we need to fear him and, and hold him in high honor and esteem and submit to his ways because he's so great and so we simply cry glory glory to the Lord let's Give him the glory. Let's worship him for he is so mighty. He is so wonderful. He is so full of, of, of worth and we can trust him and lean upon him. And he is greater than any trouble that we may face. Now it's very interesting that the structure of this psalm is written in very similar language to poems of praise to Baal, the Canaanite god and of, and, and of other nations around, the, the god of thunder and rain. Now, why does he do this? Well, he's combining praise to God with mockery of Baal. Because Baal is a false god who doesn't deserve the praise of heaven, who can't rule the oceans, who can't create storms, that destroy great forests. He is nothing. But our God is a God who rules the universe and nothing can stand in his way. And sometimes we can be so discouraged and it seems like uh, the enemy is so mighty. But he is a false God and a failure and is nothing before almighty God. Problems that seem like mountains, troubles and fears that seem like forests, deep and dark and scary. But one word from God, the living God, and they all fall to nothing. So yes, we are to ascribe, declare, meditate, speak of him, bow down in worship because of his glory in creation, but because of his comfort and care for his people. The end of the psalm, verse 11. May the Lord give strength to his people. May the Lord bless his people with peace. This is a form of a prayer in the ESV, very similar to the prayer at the end of verse 9 of Psalm 28. Oh, save your people and bless your heritage. Be their shepherd and carry them forever. But it could also be seen as a declaration because the word may is not in the Hebrew. So he, you could say the Lord gives strength to his people. 
the Lord blesses his people with peace. And indeed, some translations uh, do that with this verse. Now, prayer and declaration often go together. As we pray, we begin to speak out who God is and what he's like. And that then encourages us in our praying. Now, may is not a doubt. It's a declaration of confidence. It's saying God is like this and I'm expressing confidence in him and looking to him to do what he is able to do. And because he is the God of strength who rules the universe, we can ask him for strength. Strength to trust him, strength to obey him, strength in our physical, spiritual, mental, emotional weakness, strength from him, strength to speak the gospel, strength to live for his glory. But we also can ask him for that peace And of course, that peace is seen supremely when we come to God, because through uh, faith in Christ, through being justified by faith, we have peace with God. But also that inner peace and that rest as we have confidence in him. And of course, this flows out of verses one to nine because he is a God of glory and strength, because he deserves the glory due his name, because he is holy, because he is a mighty one who rules creation. From the great cedars of Lebanon and the ocean, the, the, the Mediterranean Sea, the great wilderness, to the tender birthing of a deer. He is worthy of our glory and he's a God who can strengthen us and give us peace. But notice verse 10. The Lord sits, or better sat, enthroned over the flood. Now the word flood here is the word used of Noah's flood. This is pointing back to this God who rules creation in the storm is a God who rules creation in justice as he sat enthroned at the flood. He reigned there in justice and now the Lord sits, present tense, enthroned as king forever. The same God of justice who demonstrated his justice and majesty at the flood of Noah, is the same God today who rules the nations. We may cry out for justice. We may wonder why that we have the situation in Ukraine, why we have such trouble here in our own country. What is going on around the world as, as people suffer, as there is great trouble, but the Lord is still upon the throne. And therefore, For we, his people, we can come to him and say, Lord, God of justice, you're the God who is who also gives us peace. So you have saved us. Again, David didn't didn't know Jesus, but he looked forward to Jesus. Many of his Psalms prophesy about Jesus. And, And Jesus is the one who has satisfied the justice of God Almighty. And through faith in him, we have peace. A day is coming when there will not be a flood of water, but a flood of the fire of God's justice. Will we we be ready for that day? Are you ready for that day? Have you put your trust in Jesus Christ, your saviour? It's very interesting. This psalm is an illustration to us of something that happens in the New Testament. It starts with ascribe to the Lord, O heavenly being, and it ends with... May the Lord bless his people with peace. There is an incident in Luke chapter 2 where the angels ascribe glory to God and bless God's people with peace. We find it in the appearance of the angels to the shepherds. Luke 2, 13 and 14. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. Glory to God in the highest, ascribe to the Lord, O heavenly beings, ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. May the Lord bless his people with peace. Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. Christ the true and better David. 
Christ is the one who fulfills this psalm. He is the one that God said, let all the angels worship him. He is the one who comes to earth and demonstrates his power over creation. He rules the storm and speaks peace to it there on the Sea of Galilee. He creates uh, from those few pieces of bread food to feed 5,000. He creates wine out of water and he's the one who demonstrates his power over the greater things than mentioned in this psalm. He destroys sickness, he defeats demons, and he destroys the power of death. And he comes and shakes the very foundations of false religion in, in that temple in Jerusalem where there was the outward form without the reality of of truly knowing God in those days. Right? Well, yes, they were still a faithful remnant, but for many, it was just simply an outward form. And all of that religion, outward religion of the Pharisees and Sadducees were shaken to its very roots. He defeats sin and he overcomes the devil and he destroys death rising from the dead, shaking the ground and bursting from the tomb. And indeed, when, when he died, there was that mighty earthquake and the curtain in the temple was torn in two he shook he came and shook everything to bring new life to those who would trust in him and now he sits enthroned with the ancient of days ruling over the kingdoms and the nations of the earth and all creation and sustaining all things with his powerful word and he strengthens his people and he gives them his peace. All who believe in him have peace with God. Do you believe in him? Have you repented of your sin and trusted Jesus Christ? And the day is coming when he will come again and everything will be shaken. And he will establish his kingdom in righteousness and hand all things to the Father and will reign with him forever. In eternal peace. That's the destiny. How great the troubles are. That's your destiny. This is the God we serve. If you're a Christian, this is the God who is your God. So you can and must declare his worth and have your thoughts and words full of him. This is what we must do. This is how we're going to have that strength and peace in this troubled world. Joining with the angels, rejoicing in him and falling down in worship and submission. How little we worship, how little we think about him, how little we meditate upon him, how little we talk about him, how little we worship, how full our lives are with so many other things and not him. Lord, help us have lives full of you. And you can trust him and his powerful word, a powerful word that rules creation, can speak into your life, build faith, transform you, can speak as you share it to unbelievers and transform them. And his word that breaks the cedars, that makes the mountains skip, that creates the thunder and the storm and the lightning, that rules all of creation also rules your life and speaks to you and needs to be listened to and obeyed. And you can walk in his strength because he's a God of strength. And you can enjoy his peace through Christ, have peace in your heart because you're safe in the hands of the Lord God Almighty. The song we're going to learn in our face-to-face -face service and it's called Ancient of Days and the first verse and chorus says this, though the nations rage, sorry I'll start again, though the nations rage, kingdoms rise and fall, there is still one king reigning over all, so I will not fear for this truth remains that my God is the Ancient of Days. None above him, none before him, all of time in his hands. For his throne it shall remain and ever stand. All the power, 
all the glory. I will trust in his name. For my God is the ancient of days. Let's pray. Our Father, you know the troubles that we have, the great fears we have, the things that seem like 3,000 foot mountains, mighty forests that are impregnable and seem unshakable. And yet you are God. You are the eternal God. And if we are believers in Christ, we are your people and you're the covenant keeping God and you keep your covenant with us. And Lord God, we know you and you, no one will snatch us out of your hand. And Father, we pray you'd help us to have our thoughts, our, our meditations full of you, our speech full of you. That we would trust in your mighty word, that we would submit to your mighty word. And Lord God, that we will be so awestruck that we see our troubles in the light of your glory. Give us strength, Father, and give us your peace. For we ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. May God bless you in abundance. Thank you for listening.